I'd like to agree with you, but I can't. Yorgos Paniotidis is the contrarian. Today I want to talk to you about intelligence, that mythical capacity of coherent thought that we value so much in animals, friends, and in some cases even family. It is probably a non-controversial statement to say that board gaming is about intelligence, in the sense that playing board games allows us to make use of our intelligence, in much the same way that weightlifting allows us to make use of our physical strength. Intelligence is one of the predominantly used traits when we play. The decisions we make are generally based on our understanding of the game state during our turn and on how capable we are in evaluating the options the game presents us with. Which is great. One of the reasons why board games appeal is because they let us flex these mental muscles. They let us exercise parts of our brain that may or may not be underused in our daily life. I think of games less as a form of escapism, but as a complementary form of exercise. It's like how Sudoku puzzles train you to count up to nine, or how Liar's Dice teaches you to accidentally bump into the table on purpose. But is intelligence really the point of board games? Or is it just something we grow accustomed to make use of the more games we play? It would neatly explain the immediate appeal board games have to some people, namely those who would like to use their minds to accomplish something but don't have an outlet for that desire. Like people who would like to punch something but don't personally know any Nazis. Board games can be a substitute for intellectual engagement in lieu of a better alternative. It can also be many, many more things of course, and not an alternative to something else. But I believe that people who do like to think logically, for lack of a better term, might find that board games help scratch that particular itch. We can freely indulge in it here. We can put a game on the table, new or old, and make that muscle between our ears work overtime for the fun of it. All of that is great, and it's only tangentially related to what today's screed of the contrarian is about. I am more interested in the parts where that appreciation of board games as playful arenas where we can use our intelligence is reduced to a competition between minds, where the challenge that games place on the players becomes instead an attempt to affirm one's intellectual superiority, where the game is not merely a shared celebration of what Huitzinger called play spirit, but also a squabble for garnering esteem, self or otherwise, from your peers. Board games, specifically strategy games of a certain size and depth, are preoccupied with intelligence, and by extension and over time, so are the players. The more intricate and involved those games become, the more they ask of their players. The bigger the cognitive workload to play competitively, the bigger the satisfaction in succeeding in it. But this can also all too quickly devolve into something that reminds me of this weird sense of machismo that surrounds eating a really, really hot curry. The sense of one-upmanship in who can withstand the scorching heat in his mouth the longest without flinching. Who can dismiss 5,000 Scoville as a mild tingling while manly men take on 30,000 Scoville and more? But whereas the cult of spicy food is a display of physical endurance and resistance to pain, in games it is treated as a display of great intellectual prowess. Turning away from the act of play, the joy of participation, interaction and surprise and instead focusing on displaying your analytical ability, your skill at evaluating probabilities and maneuvering within a complex set of limits and limitations to reach a specific destination. Victory. I don't think it's a coincidence that when talking about these games, chance, randomness or luck is seen as watering down the essence of gaming. Or in other words, that a game with less randomization is considered pure and more refined and a game that embraces random number generators like dice or shuffled decks is considered less evolved than its deterministic brethren. By removing unpredictability from the game engine itself and making player choice close to, if not the only variable, we relocate the game from the table into the heads of the players. So instead of the challenge residing in the game and the competition occurring between players, the two are fused 
it is your opponent that provides both challenge and competition. The game is a mere conduit that lets you pit yourself against others. The game will not keep you from winning. It is your choices and your choices alone that do that. Personally, I reject the notion that games where your defeat is down only to the choices you've made, not some unpredictable turn of events, are somehow better. Not only do these games sell the naive fantasy that we are all in truth masters of our own fate, that we don't have to play the hand that's dealt to us, that the only reason we are not winning is that we're not trying hard enough or simply are not good enough. But when coupled with a competitive dynamic, with a machismo of gaming, we move into the actively harmful idea of victory ennobling the victor, of the elite rising to the top. Suddenly victory is not confined to the magic circle of the game, but reaches beyond it to say something about us as individuals. Not only did I win a game, my victory also proves that I am smarter than you, better than you. This sense of latent antagonism, of confrontation that is only a snap of the fingers away from breaking out, informs the feel of a gaming group. It affects how open and welcoming a community appears to people not intimately familiar with its customs and culture. I've spoken in other pieces like this one about the need for etiquette at board gaming, specifically the need to routinely and constantly signal your desire to be inclusive and welcoming even as you take another player out of the running for first place or reduce their involvement in the game to insignificance. This isn't just about sparing another person's feelings. It is to make sure that the events within the game are clearly separate from our relationship outside of it. To highlight the fact that a player's performance in a game is not a display of their intelligence and by extension immaterial to how they are perceived by the other players. But even outside of an individual game group, Championing certain games for their focus on intelligence can become a display not of our taste but of our sophistication and intellect. It can become a pedestal from which we judge the simple, the ignorant and the oblivious. A proud if not vain declaration that we have outgrown the toys and playthings of children. In short, when we make games out to be only about intelligence, when we think of them as a stage to perform mental feats for others to be impressed by, when we pose and flex our mental muscles to the announcement of numbers that are expected to invoke awe in our audience as sweat drips from our brow, we are losing sight of something valuable. Games may very well be about intelligence, but play is not. We love games because they let us play. They let us subvert expectations of ourselves and of others. They let us dance around the fine line between the serious and the frivolous. They let us, ironically enough, step out of our heads for a while and just be in the moment. When we engage games, we get to manifest and celebrate our play spirit, not our intelligence. Because to quote Johann Huitzinger, to dare, to take risks, to bear uncertainty, to endure tension, these are the essence of the play spirit. <laughs>